Thank you, folks. Let's get this out of the way. I don't think I need that today. About 15 years ago, Debbie, my wonderful wife, and I uh, built a small cabin in the north woods of Wisconsin about 100 miles north of Green Bay, away from a lot of people. That's kind of what pastors do, you know. We work with people, then we want to get away from people. And though, I, you know, I'm kind of in the woods up there, I've, I've made some friendships. I've built some relationships. Uh, one of them was with uh, a neighbor on one side. We have a great relationship. He doesn't speak English, and I don't speak Polish. You know, we just kind of nod. You know, everything's good. And then on the other side, I got a great relationship with uh, the couple there, the, the, the wife. Uh, Beth is a physician at the local hospital, and I, I just love having a neighbor nearby. It just gives you a certain kind of peace, doesn't it, to have a physician next door. And then I've got a handy-andy dude named Ted, because if you don't know it, I'm the son of a garbage man, and my favorite tool is a sledgehammer and... Um, I need a handy-andy to help me fix things. But my real go-to guy, the guy I love more than anyone else, is my plumber. I tell you, if you're going to have a place up in the North Woods, you need a great relationship with your plumber. I don't even know what the guy's name is. I just call him my plumber. I know he's from Goodman, uh, Wisconsin, and the name of the company is Goodman, so I guess I could just call him a good man. But really, he's just my plumber. I don't know what I'd do without him, because over the years, I've had to call on him to crawl into my crawl space and fix a pipe that cracked over the winter. I've had to have him come out and replace my hot water heater, replace the pump in my well, replace a toilet, and even empty my septic tank. I love my plumber. Did I tell you that? He's reliable. When I call, he shows up. He does a great job. He even has a key to my place. So he can call, I can just call him and he'll go there and fix whatever I need fixing. I love, did I tell you? I love my plumber. And I love the Lord. Who, like my plumber, responds to my every call. He steps into my mess, fixes my broken pipes, shows up when I call him, answers my every prayer, He's reliable. He's trustworthy. He's faithful. His love and grace are never ending. His mercy overflows, and I've given him the keys of my life. Now, you may be wondering about this comparison between my plumber and my God. I was prompted to reflect on this after reading a, a book by a New York artist and author whose name is Mako Fujimura. I just love saying that, Mako Fujimura. And he wrote this book called Art and Faith. And Mako suggests that me, you, us, too many of us have a deficient view of God. That when push comes to shove, we view our God much like we view our plumber. You know, he's the person we call on to fix the broken pipes of our lives. And he always shows up. He calls it plumbing theology. I think he tips his hat to N.T. Wright for that little phrase. And with no disrespect intended for plumbers, because I've already said I love my plumber, 
he encourages his readers to hold a more expansive view of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I admit initially being offended by the idea that my relationship with the Lord is similar to my relationship with my plumber. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized he's right. God is my plumber. God is the one I call on to fix the broken pipes in my life. God is the one who empties the septic tank of my soul. Yeah, I have a plumbing theology, and I'm in good company. Because throughout Scripture, I read of men and women who ask God to fix the broken pipes of their lives. They were sick and received healing. They were barren and became pregnant. They were weak and they became strong. They were hungry and received provision. They were sinking deep in sin and were lifted up. They were outnumbered and yet won to victory. And they called on the Lord and the Lord broke, fixed the broken pipes of their lives. And they praised the Lord, the source of all their blessings. They loved the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength for the great things he has done. And perhaps you're like me. You love your plumber. I hope you do. Anybody married to a plumber today? Any? I didn't think this crowd would have one. I'm going, I'm preaching a couple weeks. I think I'll have a couple in the audience there. A couple women. Yeah, I love my plumber. I hope you love your plumber. I hope you got a good one. And I hope you love the Lord who, like your plumber, fixes the broken pipes in your life. But here's the question that I'm wrestling with. What happens when that which is broken can't be fixed? Oh, don't give me your pious mumbo jumbo that we worship a God who does all things. He can do the impossible. I don't see those grade school students in Texas rising from the grave anytime soon. Families have been broken, destroyed. And I don't see those Ukrainian Christians returning to their destroyed homes anytime soon. What happens, my friends, when that which is broken in life can't be fixed. When you have to simply live with what you have. It is then that we need a God who is far more than a plumber. No disrespect intended to plumbers. But when that which is broken can't be fixed, we need a God who is more than a plumber. For if all we have is a God who is a plumber, who do we pray to when that which is broken can't be fixed? In whom do we place our hope when that which is broken can't be fixed? We need a God who is far more than a plumber, and we find such a God in the book of Revelation, chapter 4 and 5. My wife said to me before I came, she said, what are you preaching on? I said, Revelation. She said, oh, my, that's going to be bad. 
<laughs> I'm married to a woman who says what's ever on her mind. Let me tell you a little bit about the book of Revelation before I, we just go to it. The book was written by the Apostle John at a time when he was most likely the only apostle living. All the others had died a martyr's death. All the others had been killed for the faith, except John. In fact, John is the only one who dies a natural death. The book was written during a time of great tribulation for the Christians. Think of Ukraine, and that will give you an idea. The Christians were being persecuted by the Romans. The Romans considered Christianity a threat to the empire because Christians spoke of Christ as their ruler and as the king of a kingdom. So the Romans thought the Christians guilty of treason. You can worship no other king but Rome. So on that basis, they arrested, they imprisoned, and killed many followers of Jesus. They did this actually for 300 years, beginning with Nero in the 60s and then in the 90s. It just picked up all the way until 300 AD. And the book was written for Christians who were experiencing this suffering and disappointment, who were crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken us? And asking with Job, why the heathen prosper and evil flourishes? In other words, it was written to Christians for whom that which was broken could not be fixed. And it was written as a message of hope to those who needed a God who's far more than a plumber. No disrespect to plumbers. The core of the message is shared in a vision that we're going to read in Revelation 4 and 5. And this vision serves as a postscript to the previous vision of the letters to the seven churches and a prelude to all that follows, including the seven seals of tribulation. And the vision was given to the early Christians to remind them, to assure them, that they will experience tribulation as will be described in the seals, the vision of the seals. And yet, no matter what happens on earth, they should never forget that God and God alone is sovereign. That in the midst of the mess, in the midst of the destruction, in the midst of the sorrow, they should gaze upon the one who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. A simple message. Frankly, uh, it's just hard to grasp it because it's so simple. But one I trust will resonate with you today. I'm going to read the vision in four parts. I'm going to ask you to listen as I read and imagine what is described. The book of Revelation is... I'm sure you've heard apocalyptic literature, a short word for apocalyptic literature. It's like an animated motion picture by Disney. All right, that's just kind of the big, bold colors. So just think animated, beauty and the beast. Revelation 4, 1 through 6. I looked... And there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. We might say diamonds and rubies. And a rainbow resembling an emerald circled the throne. 
And surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, there were seven lamps blazing, the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass as clear as crystal. Notice with me in this first part of the vision, the throne of God. The word throne dominates the vision in these two chapters. Well, it occurs 46 times in the entire book, 19 times in these two chapters, 17 times with reference to the throne of God. It's pretty clear what John wants us to focus on. In the midst of our trial and tribulation, the throne of God. And God the Father sitting on the throne, but John can't even describe him, so he describes his radiant appearance as precious gems and jewels, and the flash of jewelry portrays God's majesty. The throne in heaven is positioned in the center, not of heaven, as we will learn shortly, but of the universe. For every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and all that is in them is worshiping the lamb on the throne. So the throne here clearly represents the glory of God, the sovereignty of God above all the confusion of the world. It reminds us that the world is not without a ruler. It is not rolling on from age to age like a ship without a pilot. It has a guide, a king, whose throne is established on high. And as a result, our affairs rest not in the hands of people, but of God. And when struggles come, and they will, and stuff breaks that cannot be fixed happen, let us catch a vision, says John, of the throne that rules the universe. In the midst of our trial, may our gaze be riveted upon the one who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 4, verse 1 the throne of God. And now verse 7 to 11, we continue. In the center, around the throne, ready for this, were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second like an ox. The third had a face like a man and the fourth was like a flying eagle. And each of the creatures... Four living creatures had six wings covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty who was and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne who lives forever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. The first part of the vision was the throne of God. The second part of the vision is dominated by the worship of God. This large and diverse congregation joining in worship. Four living creatures who may represent all living creatures. An entire community of the redeemed represented by the 24 elders wearing their crown, their garments of holiness and their crowns of victory. 
24 to represent the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament and the 12 apostles of the New. And this aspect of the vision speaks to us for it confirms that our purpose as a people created in the image of God is to glorify him and enjoy him forever. We may lose everything, But we have a God who's sovereign over all, a God whom we may worship with our hearts, bodies, minds, and souls. We may not be what we used to be. We may not be able to do what we used to do. A bunch of stuff is broken that just can't be fixed. But still, the vision reminds us that when all is said and done, we've been created by God in his image to glorify him and enjoy him forever. So no matter what the situation, no matter what the context, we may join in worship to our wonderful, wonderful, glorious God. Even if we lose our lives for the Lord, we will simply be transported to heaven where we will praise the Lord with an incredible congregation. I can't wait to see those living beasts. That's got to be cool. I, I got to see that eye thing. You know what I mean? The <laughs> eyes all around, under the wings. I just don't get it. Why do you have eyes under your wings? I... But John is not done in this important vision in, in Revelation 5 verse 1 we first saw the, the throne of God then the worship of God and now the scroll of God this is intriguing are you still with me I'm not losing you am I because my wife said it's going to be bad <clears throat> then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Anybody in the house? Worthy. You living beasts, you elders, you apostles, you patriarchs. Who? But no one in heaven and on earth or under the earth could open the scroll and even look inside. No one. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. See, God has a scroll in his right hand. And the scroll is God's eternal, all-encompassing plan that we like to summarize as creation, fall, redemption, recreation, and everything in between. It symbolizes God's purpose with respect to the entire universe throughout history concerning all creatures in all ages to all eternity. And the scroll is closed. God's will is unrevealed and unexecuted. To open the scroll means that you can carry out the plan of God. And no one can open the scroll except the Lion of Judah, who we will soon discover is the Lamb of God. For God has this plan, and Christ is the administrator of the plan. God has a plan, a scroll. He's sovereign over us, active in the world, making all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. Not that all things are good, but he's working in such a way that the manure of life fertilizes the field of our souls and produces beautiful fruit, the scroll of God. But then the vision concludes with the Lamb of God. Then I saw a lamb as if it had been slain. but standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. This lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. 
And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. And then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 encircling the throne and the creatures and the elders and this loud voice they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb of God be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The Lamb of God who inhabits the throne of God worthy to receive our praise. I'm going to skip that Ephesians 1. So let me go back to the beginning. Let me just hydrate. I love my plumber. I mean, I'm serious. If you've had problems, you know. He's, you know, when I call him, he's there. He's reliable, he's ready, he fixes the broken stuff of my life, the broken pipes of my life. And I love my God who, like my plumber, fixes broken things. I look back over my life now of a few years and I just see where God has directed, he's healed, he's sustained, he's guided, he's provided, he's, he's done so many things for me. But what happens to my faith when that which is broken can't be fixed. If God is no more than a plumber, then I'm without hope. I have no one to pray to. I have no one to go to. I'd simply be in despair. And I have a hunch that that is why so many people live in despair today. Well, the Apostle John has encouraged me anyway to catch a glimpse of God sitting on his throne in the center of the universe receiving perpetual praise to catch a glimpse of Jesus, the lion and the lamb who implements the good and perfect will of his father and to join the celestial chorus of praise and worship. I admit it seems kind of stupid. Seems kind of simplistic. That the world is going to hell in a handbasket and all you want me to do is look up. You know, I've just buried my parents who were killed by Rome and you just want me to look up. I just buried my children who were shot by some nut job and you want me to look up. But that's the message, my friends, and I've I've been struggling with it because I said, well, Lord, man, I'm going to need your Holy Spirit because um, without the Spirit, I don't think we're going to get it. 
that we need, I need this God. So what about you? Well, I hope you love your plumber. <laughs> hope you have a good one. I hope you, uh, you know, you not only love your plumber, but you, you got a good list of those people who break into your life, you know, when the house breaks and got a good doctor who fixes this. And I guess you could call my cardiologist a plumber as well. Good cardiologist. And I hope you love the Lord who, like your plumber, has fixed and will continue to fix the, the broken pipes of your life, that, that this is not meant, this message is not meant to minimize a God who says, let not your hearts be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. It doesn't minimize the, the invitation that the Lord gives us to come to him when we're weak and heavy laden. For like me, I trust you found a God who is there, who's reliable, who's trustworthy. You can look back over your life and you can see where God stepped in and fixed the broken pipes of your life. But when stuff happens in your life that can't be fixed, And you, I don't have to go through a litany. You know what I'm talking about. I hope you don't give up on God. I hope your relationship with God is more than that of a fixer. I, I hope I encourage that when stuff happens that just can't be fixed, Nothing going to bring back your loved one. Nothing's going to bring back that husband who walked out on you. Nothing's going to change the diagnosis of your child's condition. I hope when stuff happens in your life that can't be fixed, that you don't give up on God, but that instead you worship the Lord in spite of it all. <laughs> that you take your eyes off the junk of life and the tribulation of life and the sorrows of life and you look up and see a God who's sovereign over all, who's on the throne. I hope that in spite of confusion and distress which accompany suffering and sorrow, I hope you'll join the living creatures and never stop singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. Then in spite of the uncertainty and disappointment when dealing with stuff that can't be fixed, you'll join the 24 elders and the thousands upon thousands of angels and say, Lord, you are worthy. My Lord and my God in spite of all this, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you have created all things, including me, and by your will they were created and have their being. Let us pray. Lord, I'm not sure how this is supposed to work, frankly. that when stuff happens that can't be fixed, your prescription is 
to look up to the throne room of God. To see a God who's sovereign on the throne. To hear the worship of the elders and the living beasts and the angels. To see your plan, the scroll, executed and delivered by Jesus. And then to see Jesus on the, in the center of the throne with the Father, receiving all worship and glory. And I'm, I, I could imagine that each one of us or many of us are, are dealing with stuff that simply cannot be fixed. It won't be fixed until you come again. So uh, keep us from despair. Keep us from losing hope. Keep our eyes fixated on the throne. Keep us in perpetual praise to you. Pray it in the name of Jesus. And all God's people say, amen.